2019 marks the 400th anniversary of the Great Synod of Dort in the Netherlands. The Synod did fine work by God's grace in various areas, including commissioning a Dutch Bible translation. Professor Dijkstra will speak about that tomorrow afternoon. Approving six articles on the Lord's Day and drafting an improved church order, the subject of Reverend Langerak's speech. But the greatest work of the Synod of Dort was writing the Canons of Dort, which set forth the truth of the absolute sovereignty of God in salvation over against the Arminian heresies. This was the number one reason why the Synod was called. This was why foreign delegates were invited and came. And this was what took most of the Synod's time. In fact, two-thirds, that is 120, of the 180 sessions dealt with the ideas of Arminianism. The canons are particularly crucial in that they are a creed. At this huge milestone for Dort, God is calling us to a closer study of, a stronger faith in, and a deeper love for His saving grace in Jesus Christ our Lord. And this applies to those of us who have the canons of Dort as one of our official creeds, and it applies to all of the children of the Reformation. Presbyterian theologian B.B. B. Warfield writes that the canons were, quote, publicly, published authoritatively in 1619 as the finding of the Synod of Dort with the aid of a large body of foreign assessors, representative practically of the whole Reformed world. The canons, therefore, possess the moral authority of the decrees of practically an ecumenical council throughout the whole body of Reformed churches. These truths should be the delight of all who confess to believe the Bible and gospel of Jesus Christ. The canons of Dort are popularly known as the five points of Calvinism. Now, when we say five points of Calvinism, the five points summarize the five heads of the canons of Dort, which are themselves a response to and a refutation of the five articles of the Remonstrance or the Arminians, to which Professor Dijkstra referred a while ago. Even the number in the five points of Calvinism needs a little clarification in comparison with the canons of Dort, because in the canons, as you may know, the third and fourth heads are combined. So the canons consist of heads one, head two, heads three and four, and head five. And even the word Calvinism in the five points of Calvinism requires some explanation. John Calvin died in 1564. The canons were completed in 1619, 55 years later. And so the original five points of Calvinism certainly were not written by John Calvin, long dead. They weren't even culled from his many writings. 
Instead, the five points of Calvinism, based on the canons of Dort, summarize the truth of God's Word, which is in accordance with the genius of John Calvin's biblical theology. You could say, therefore, that the five points of Calvinism are an abbreviation of the five heads, with two of them being combined, on the absolute sovereignty of God in salvation, set forth by the Synod of Dort from the Holy Scriptures in the form of 93 articles, of which 59 are positive and 34 are negative, the rejection of errors. But if that's too long-winded for you, just think of them as the five points of Calvinism. That's the prevailing terminology, and I think it will remain such for the foreseeable future. What then about the acronym TULIP for the five points of Calvinism? T is for total depravity, U, unconditional election, L, limited atonement, I, irresistible grace, P, the perseverance of the saints. I find that to be a handy memory aid, and I know that it helps other people too. The tulip, very appropriately, is the unofficial national flower of the Netherlands. Dort is in the Netherlands, of course. This tulip, therefore, we can say, is a beautiful flower of God's grace. And as Herman Hoeksema pointed out, the root idea of grace is beauty. And this beautiful flower grew, blossomed, and unfolded in Dutch Reformed soil. It has been transplanted all around the world. And this is a lovely flower which is admired and cherished by the spouse of Jesus Christ. You may know that the order of the five petals of tulip differs from the order of the five heads of the canons. The T, total depravity, moves from first place to third place so that the order in the canons is old tip. The canons treats the subject unconditional election limited atonement, total depravity, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. It's worth taking a moment to compare the tulip or old tip with the titles of Dort's Five Heads of Doctrine. Unconditional election is titled in the canons of divine predestination. The word unconditional gets right to the heart of the issue with the Arminians because the Arminians were big into conditions and especially conditions with regard to election. The other word in the phrase unconditional election is not quite as felicitous because head one of the canons deals with both election and reprobation in the form of one decree. And this gives a little bit of an excuse, though not really, for some to call themselves Calvinists but only hold to election and not reprobation, whereas true Calvinism 
the Calvinism of John Calvin, and especially the Calvinism of the canons, emphatically holds both. So the U of tulip or old tip, unconditional election, would be a lot clearer and better if it were unconditional predestination, with predestination being understood in theological parlance as including both election and reprobation. Limited atonement is entitled in the canons of the death of Christ and the redemption of man thereby. And again, limited gets right to the key issue regarding Christ's death that it is particular only for the elect alone. So this should not be understood as if it implied that there were any deficiencies in our Savior or in His cross. Of the corruption of man, head three, that's now called in tulip or ultip, total depravity. Depravity, corruption, same thing. The adjective total is again excellent because man is, to quote our Heidelberg Catechism, wholly incapable of doing any good and inclined to all wickedness, except we are regenerated by the Spirit of God. Irresistible grace is titled in the canons, Man's Conversion to God and the Manner Thereof. And the grace, in irresistible grace, in the fourth head, especially refers to grace in regenerating, calling, and converting totally depraved sinners. That is, it deals particularly with grace at the start of the Christian life, though that same grace is irresistible right throughout the Christian life. And again, when it uses the word irresistible, that's precisely the right word choice. Because according to the Arminians, God wants to save everybody, tries to convert all men, but His grace is resistible. You may have noticed that the titles of the first four heads of doctrine in the canons give the broad subjects that they treat of divine predestination, of the death of Christ and the redemption of men thereby, of the corruption of man, head three, his conversion to God and the manner thereof, head four, broad subjects, merely topics. But the corresponding points in the five points of Calvinism have the virtue of identifying the precise issue at hand in opposition to the Arminians, unconditional election and reprobation versus conditional election, limited atonement versus universal atonement. Jesus shed His blood for absolutely everybody. Total depravity versus partial depravity, and irresistible grace versus resistible, weak grace. And so finally, we come to the fifth point of Calvinism. This time it does not come in the form of adjective plus noun, unlike unconditional election, limited atonement, 
total depravity, irresistible grace. Now we have the perseverance of the saints, which the fifth head of the canon entitles of the perseverance of the saints. They're practically identical. When was this acronym TULIP first used? Well, according to the most current research available to me, the TULIP acronym for the five points of Calvinism goes back at least to 1905. And the man who first listed the five points of Calvinism as TULIP was a Dr. Cleland Boyd McAfee, Dr. McAfee, in 1905. He was an American Presbyterian minister. And he used the TULIP as a teaching device in a lecture he delivered in Newark, which is the largest city in the state of New Jersey. And there are many who believe that Newark, that's one word, N-E-W-A-R-K, is a contraction of New Ark, as in New Ark, parentheses, of the covenant. Those who think that that's the origin point to the fact that what we now call Newark was settled by Connecticut Puritans in 1666. And I believe that New Ark was a very appropriate place for a lecture on the five points of Calvinism, because the mercy seat, sprinkled with blood, on the Day of Atonement, the mercy seat of the old ark is a picture of God's grace in Jesus Christ crucified. Dr. McAfee's tulip is exactly the same as that known to us in four of the five points. The exception is the letter U. Instead of unconditional election, he referred to universal sovereignty. Universal sovereignty. And I take it that he meant by universal sovereignty that God is absolute over the salvation or not of the entire human race, that is to say, election or reprobation. So let's now begin with where the canons themselves start, namely with of divine predestination. We're reformed. We like definitions. Here's Dort's own definition of election, head one, article seven. Election is the unchangeable purpose of God whereby before the foundation of the world he hath out of mere grace according to the sovereign good pleasure of his own will chosen from the whole human race which had fallen through their own fault from their primitive state of rectitude into sin and destruction a certain number of persons to redemption in Christ whom he from eternity appointed the mediator and head of the elect and the foundation of salvation. The next four articles of our canons explain the truth of election. Article 8, there is one election, both to grace and glory, to salvation and the way of salvation. 
this one election stands over against Arminianism's teaching of various decrees of election. This one election, the next article teaches, is unconditional, for it is not founded upon foreseen faith or the obedience of faith or any prerequisite cause or condition. Head 1, Article 9. And that, of course, over against Arminianism's conditional election. Canons 110 states that this one unconditional election is sovereign. And it quotes Romans 9 to this effect regarding the twins in Rebekah's womb. For the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, etc., it was said, namely to Rebekah, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. That's creedal. One unconditional, sovereign election that is unchangeable. And Canons 111 teach that election is as unchangeable as the immutable God Himself. And this, of course, over against the changeable election taught by the Arminians. The canons then explain that God's one unconditional, sovereign, and unchangeable election is like a fountain. That's the word in chapter, in head one, article nine, a fountain. What is the idea of a fountain, or to give it a different word, a spring? Well, a fountain that is a good serviceable one sends forth fresh, clear water. A spring is a source of life-giving water. And this water burst forth from beneath where it was invisible. That's a fountain. Canons 1.9 states that election is the fountain of every saving good, from which proceed faith, holiness, and the other gifts of salvation, and finally eternal life itself as its fruits or effects. Unconditional election, the fountain and source of every spiritual good. Unconditional election, the fountain and source of everlasting life itself. And the canons teach that unconditional election is this also for the elect children of believers dying in infancy. Head 1, Article 17. And for proof of this, Canons 1 9 quote Ephesians 1 verse 5, which Professor Dykstra read earlier. He hath chosen or elected us, not because we were, but that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. And that election is the source of all the other blessings spoken of in Ephesians 1 up to verse 14 read earlier. It's the source of redemption and the forgiveness of sins, our adoption and our knowledge of the will of God and the sealing of the Spirit and so forth. Now listen to the lies of the enemies of God's 
sovereign predestination. Election, they say, is dry, dry old doctrine. But it's the fountain of waters. It's very wet. Election is dead, dead as a doornail. No, no. It's the eternal fountain and source of living waters. I'll tell you what's dead. The sinner, he's dead. Sometimes they say that election makes people into the frozen chosen. But election is the fountain of flowing waters, not ice. The waters of eternal life that bubble over so that we love Him because He first loved us. And the conclusion of the Canons of Dort warns calumniators of the terrible judgment of God that awaits people who slander the truth of His divine election. And so we have two antithetical doxologies, that of cold, sterile Arminianism, blessed be the God who chose me because He foresaw that I would believe and choose Him. Or the biblical doxology, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as He hath chosen or elected us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4. Let's turn to the second head of the death of Christ and the redemption of men thereby, popularly known as limited atonement. Well, if unconditional election is a fountain, that's the image, limited atonement is Christ's sacrifice a sacrifice for the true Israel of God. And here again, the fathers at Dort speak biblically because sacrifice is the dominant biblical idea of Christ's cross. If you read the Old Testament, and let's say especially Leviticus 1 through 7, you'll see that you need an altar an earthen altar, a stone altar, or a brazen altar. You need a priest. From Moses' time onward, this was a descendant of Aaron. And you need a victim, a bullock, a ram, a dove, a goat, whatever. And Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God and sinless Son of Man, is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek, and the Lamb of God, who offered Himself up to God on the altar of the cross once and for all. And it's no wonder that the canons call Jesus, quote, the only and most perfect sacrifice. Canons 2, 3. And they describe His work in sacrificial terms. According to the canons, and I'm choosing my words carefully here, Jesus is our surety and substitute, quote, who was made sin and became a curse for us and in our stead. And so Jesus made full payment for the debt of our transgressions 
of the law of God as a complete satisfaction to divine justice on our behalf. Jesus was our trespass offering. Isaiah 53, verse 10, quoted in Canons 2, Rejection 1, the particular offering that especially emphasizes payment to the justice of God. And I continue especially quoting the very language of our canons. By Jesus' sacrificial blood and atoning death under God's curse and wrath, He propitiated or appeased God's wrath. He expiated or blotted out our sins. He redeemed us from iniquity. He reconciled us to our heavenly Father, and He purged us of all our transgressions. And we ask the question, for whom did Jesus accomplish and achieve all this? the elect and not the reprobate, the sheep and not the goats, his seed and not the seed of the serpent, his church and not the synagogue of Satan. These are the people who are called Christ's friends, Christ's sons, his children, his brethren, his people, and the many, and not everybody head for head. And here the key article is Canons 2 8. Christ effectually redeemed out of every people, tribe, nation, and language all those and those only who were from eternity chosen to salvation and given him by his Father. You are all, I trust, familiar with the five solas, or onlys, or alones, which sum up key biblical and Reformation truths. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone, to the glory of God alone, and according to Scripture alone. Well, here's another alone, or only. Christ alone died for the elect alone or only. That only, with respect to the extent of His atonement, is included for us as part of Christ alone. The Reformed believer says, I receive this gospel truth through grace alone, by faith alone, according to Scripture alone, and to the glory of God alone. So again, we have two contrasting doxologies, this time regarding Christ's cross. This is the song of Arminianism. Christ was slain and made our redemption possible if we but use our free will aright. And I say this is the song of Arminianism because the hymn books are full of rubbish like this. And on the other hand, this is the new song of the saints to the Lamb, Thou art worthy, for Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by Thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and tribe and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. Revelation 5. The third head is entitled Of the Corruption of Man or Total Depravity. We looked at the fountain and the only and most perfect sacrifice for sin According to the canons, man is dead in sin, head three, four, number three, 
and he is in spiritual death. Article 16. And as proof that the unregenerate is, quote, really and utterly dead in sin, the canons quote Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 5, ye were dead through trespasses and sin. This biblical and reformed teaching stands in sharp opposition to the semi-Pelagianism of Rome. Man is merely sick and therefore not dead. And to the Arminianism of most of evangelicalism, man has a free will and therefore is not dead. According to the opening three articles of the third and fourth heads, man's fall, Article 1, man's original sin, Article 2, man's utter depravity, Article 3, have left him dead to the true God, dead to the Christ of Scripture, dead to the gospel of grace. He is dead in sin with body and soul, in heart and mind and will, so that, as the canons state, head 3, 4, article 3, without the regenerating grace of the Holy Spirit, they are neither able nor willing, one, to return to God, two, to reform the depravity of their nature, and three, to dispose themselves to reformation. Well, that covers all the loopholes. There's no way out. And it's this truth, which is taught alone in the Holy Scriptures and taught by the Holy Spirit to the elect, that makes us cry out from the heart, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. And we don't add, except for my free will, which is what Arminianism has to add according to its theology. The fourth head, or man's conversion to God and the manner thereof, is irresistible grace. And what beautiful biblical imagery do, do the canons use for irresistible grace? It's called a spiritual, quote, resurrection from the dead. Head 3, 4, Article 12. And the Scripture here is Ephesians 2, verse 1 and verse 9 again. And you hath he quickened, or made alive, or resurrected, who were dead in trespasses and sin. And here's the biblical logic of Canons 3 and 4. Man is dead in sin, total depravity. Therefore, he needs a spiritual resurrection from the dead. That's the only way of deliverance. And again, we have here, too, two antithetical thanksgivings. This is the thanksgiving according to Arminian theology. I thank you, Lord, for saving me through the right use of my free will, so that I did not resist but consent to thy gentle advising grace and moral suasion and so distinguished myself above others equally furnished with grace sufficient for faith and conversion. That's the language the Arminians used and which is quoted in our canons. And the biblical Calvinist doesn't need any of that. He just needs Ephesians 3. Now on to him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, 
Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And so we come to the fifth and final head of the perseverance of the saints. One beautiful biblical image that the canons use here is that of God's hand. Canons 5, rejection 3. The Father's hand envelops each and every regenerate child of God, an almighty yet gentle hand, with a grip that never fails and will not let us go. And the hand of the triune God operates through Christ's hand, for the Father always operates or works through the Son, as especially John 5 makes clear. Our Savior's hand is some hand. It embraces all the elect members of His universal church, some hand, so that not one of his people is plucked out and none of his sheep are snatched away. Canons 5, Rejection 3, quotes Christ's comforting words in John 10, words uttered regarding Christ's sheep. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. This is the comforting biblical and reformed truth. God preserves all His saints so that every one of them perseveres in holiness. The true believer falls, but he never falls away. The regenerate may fall into sin, but he cannot fall into hell. To quote an image used by Spurgeon, a believer may fall on the ship, but he does not fall overboard. And on the other hand, here are some of the absurdities of Arminianism that are pointed out in our canons. A man may have everlasting life one day, but lose it the next. Some everlasting life. One having lost his first regeneration can be born again and again and again. The incorruptible seed of regeneration can be corrupted. That's Arminianism. It is neither Scripture nor reason. And so again, we have two opposing thanksgivings regarding the future of the saints in this life. We start again with the Arminians. Father, I thank Thee that not only did I use my free will aright in accepting salvation in the first place, but also that I, unlike many others, have not fallen from salvation, nor committed the unpardonable sin. So far. Yet. That's the best they can do with their theology, and it's terrifying. And the last two verses of the penultimate book of the Bible puts this confession instead in the heart and mouth of the child of God. 
now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. You will have noticed that we have used a phrase from the canons to summarize the truth of tulip or old tip as arranged by the fathers at Dort. Unconditional election, that's the fountain of every saving good. One nine. Limited atonement, the only and most perfect sacrifice. Canons 2.3. Total depravity, that's dead in sin. Irresistible grace is a spiritual resurrection from the dead. And the perseverance of the saint is the Father's hand. Do we have an expression from the canons that can be used to bring together the five points of Calvinism? I think you've all guessed the answer. We do. Canons 1, Rejections 2, refers to the golden chain of our salvation. It appeals to Romans 8, verse 30, one of the most quoted texts in the canons. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified and whom he justified them, he also glorified. One verse. The whole truth of the canons, you could say, is summed up in one verse. Let's relate this verse and its teachings to the five points of Calvinism in the five heads of our canons. Whom he did predestinate, that's unconditional election. Them he also called, well, calling is a blessing obtained only for the elect by Christ's cross, the effectual call, limited atonement. Them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and the effectual call and justification, that's irresistible grace. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And glorification presupposes the perseverance of the saints. That's necessary to get from calling and justification to glorification. God must preserve and keep His own. The golden chain of our salvation, then, consists of its first link in eternity past, so to speak, unconditional election. The second link was added some 2,000 years ago in Christ's limited atonement, the only most perfect sacrifice. And the other links come in our own lifetimes, irresistible grace and the perseverance of the saints ensuring our glorification. All this, of course, being occasioned and all this presupposing our total depravity. This chain of our salvation is made of metal, it's strong and unbreakable, and it's made of gold because it's exceedingly precious. Now, what about Arminianism? Arminianism has no chain that starts in heaven. No unconditional election. No chain that comes down from heaven to earth two millennia ago in Christ's particular and efficacious atonement. No chain that grips us powerfully in irresistible grace. No chain that embraces and preserves us. Nothing like the fifth head of our 
talent. In Arminianism, salvation depends on man, man's free will, man's fulfilling prerequisites and conditions. So, if the doctrines of grace constitute this beautiful and invincible golden chain of salvation, what would be an appropriate metaphor for Arminianism? And I thought about this long and hard when I prepared this speech, and I couldn't come up with an answer, so I did what all ministers should do in a tight spot. I asked my wife. I said, Mary, what should it be? Off the cuff, she immediately said, well, it's easy, a paper chain. And I goes, yeah, yeah, it's a paper chain. There's a golden chain of salvation. That's the biblical Reformed faith, Arminianism. It's a paper chain because a paper chain easily breaks with even the slightest pull. And this is an awful reflection on the church world today because, like children, much of the church world is entranced by the paper chain of Arminianism. Weak, flimsy, for show. The sort of thing that your child might make and come to you and say, see, mommy, look what I've done. Yeah, look what you've done. You and your free will and your own good works and your preserving yourself. Yeah, weak, flimsy, paper chain. To close, beloved, we need a firm grasp of the true gospel of sovereign grace. We require not only the few short phrases of tulip, they are useful memory aids, they help my memory at least, but they are designed to lead us back to the original five points of Calvinism, the five heads of Dort. We need the full canons stated in all 93 articles, including the 39 rejection of errors, that's real biblical Calvinism. And this is the creedal gospel, and the reformed gospel, and the biblical gospel, and the only saving gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.